right. Thanks for that introduction. <laughs> Um, so yeah, like Adrian said, I uh, work in SEO. I uh, work at the Richards Group currently. I've been there for three years now, um, and uh, but I've done SEO for the past ten years overall. Uh, just just my main job, and uh, yeah, I really really uh, enjoy it. Um, and so my my goal for you guys is to um, you know once this presentation is over, for you to kind of walk away with a new perspective of um, how search engines work and how you would be able to um, kind of manipulate your content so that you can um, rank higher and therefore get more traffic. And so we'll go ahead and get started. Edgar, um, yeah. Sorry, I just want to remind you that uh, you're supposed to try to make this fun. So. What's that? You're supposed to try to make this fun. Oh, okay. <laughs> <laughs> Oh, wow. Uh, yeah, I think Take I missed it off. The there you go. Fun part. <laughs> I know I'm in work mode right now. I just finished working, so I'm still kind of like, you know, with blinders on. But, um, but yeah, I kind of, uh, so I do that during the day. And then I uh, also uh, do some painting on the side. Um, and so, yeah, I... Uh, Happy to be here with you guys. I'm not sure if I know many of you, um, but hopefully we can meet at some point. Um, yeah, Adrian, what are you thinking? What? How should we make this fun? Oh, uh, I don't really know how. <laughs> I'm just messing with you. I'm now muted, so you don't have to worry about me. Oh, fantastic! Yeah. So, goodbye. I'll come back at the end. <laughs> All righty, so I'm gonna share my screen. Here we go. All right, so I titled this SEO Made Fun, How to Reverse Engineer Your Art for Googs. Googs being the Google, uh, the father of all search engines. Um, the reason why I have a job, basically. So, um, Right before we start, kind of just a little bit of housekeeping. Um, as far as website essentials, if you have a website um, or any type of online property, uh, make sure you have uh, at least the first two. So you wanna have a, a Google Search Console property um, and you also wanna have access to Google Analytics. Um, Google Search Console property, basically it's, it's how you communicate with Google and how Google would communicate with you if they have an issue with your site. Uh, and it's specific to organic traffic. You can see your performance there, your impressions, what kind of keywords are driving traffic to your website. Uh, you're also able to see if you have like any page load issues or anything like that. Um, so it's definitely an essential Google Analytics. You can see all channels. So if you have any type of social going on, driving traffic to your site, uh, referral traffic, you know, that's traffic from other websites. Um, you'll be able to see that kind of information in Google Analytics. And then finally, Google My Business, uh, if you have a studio or any type of uh, place where people can come to visit, um, uh, you, you wanna make sure you create a Google My Business property. Um, and then finally, Google Merchant Center, it's if you are um, selling anything online, whether it's uh, paintings, uh, sculptures, if it's merch, whatever it is, uh, I would recommend getting a Google Merchant Center account. Uh, basically, you, could, you would be able to sell your products directly on Google. Okay. So basically, I've kind of cut it up into four parts. Uh, talk about SEO, kind of the evolution, look at the landscape um, of, you know, how far it's been since it uh, started uh, almost 25, 30 years ago. Uh, look at ranking factors. You know, what is it about your website that makes you rank uh, higher than others? Uh, talk about search intent, um, and that'll have to do with the reverse engineering uh, part of the title. Um, talk about what rich results are, and then talk about kind of like what's going on nowadays and the past two years uh, with the emergence of something called zero click search. We'll also go into the technical aspect, um, uh, you know, not to, not to stay you know, too deep into the technical because I can get kind of boring. Um, and then move on to the content. Um, you know, site architecture, it sounds technical, but hopefully it'll make sense of how to be able to, to arrange the content on your website to make it easier for search engines to, uh, to view it. 
Uh, and then finally, we'll go just talk a little deeper into Google My Business and uh, Google My Merchant Centers. Center. Wow. All right. So when we're talking about SEO, we're talking about all search engines, and that includes YouTube, Bing, Yahoo, Wikipedia, uh, obviously Google, DuckDuckGo, Pinterest, Amazon, and Ask or Ask Jeeves, as they used to be called. Uh, but for the sake of uh, this whole presentation, we're going to be talking about uh, Google. Uh, and why is that is because they basically control 95% of the market share when it comes to searches on mobile devices. Um, so, I mean, if you just like, this is kind of mind blowing to think about, but Google receives about 63,000 searches per second on any given day. Um, and actually this is data from like four or five months ago. So it's probably higher now. Um, and that pretty much equates to like 3.8 million searches per minute. 228 million searches per hour, 5.6 billion searches per day, and 2 trillion searches per year, uh, which is just a huge chunk of information, um, you know, going back and forth. So Google is the king. Google is here to stay. You can see that Yahoo trails it. Um, you know, they have a, a 2.7 market share followed by Bing. DuckDuckGo is kind of trying to make uh, a go at, um, it's basically take, it's trying to take advantage of Google's issues with privacy, with user privacy and saying, you know, DuckDuckGo doesn't follow you. Um, so, but again, you know, 0.98 market share, uh, Google uh, is definitely the king here and it, it just keeps uh, increasing every year. All right, so a little story about backlinks. So about 25 years ago, um, the way that Yahoo um, and other search engines from back in the day used to rank websites is the amount of keywords that you used to have in a page. So if you had the word White House millions of times on the bottom of a page, suddenly you were outranking, uh, you know, the official White House page. So um, in 1996, two Stanford students got together and they said there, there needs to be another way for us to assert what the, how relevant a site is to whatever the search is. So their idea was to measure what other websites were linking, basically to design a web of what was connecting to what website. You know, it would make sense that if you are a, um, you know, if you sell, if you're music set, um, guitar center and you sell music products, then it would make sense that you would be linked to from, you know, other business, other businesses that are in the music industry, for example. Um, so, uh, basically they launched the company, these two Stanford students, it was called back rub off the old ad adage of you rub my back. I rub your back. You know, that's like, we're, we're connected here. We're, we're personal. So they launched the company's back rub. They quickly realized that was a terrible name uh, and quickly rebranded as Google. So that's how Google started. That's how Google kind of became. Uh, the best search engine because they were able to uh, give you results that uh, that you were looking for. Um, and, and, and they were able to do this by not only the keywords that were on the page and the content, but by measuring, you know, what are the connections on the back end? Uh, you know, what other websites connect to your website and how authoritative are those other websites? So just a little history um, of Google. And then, um, so SERP is a search engine results page. We use this acronym all the time, SERP, SERP this, SERP that. So if you're looking at, at, at what, you know, in our heads, the SERP is, you know, you rank number one here at the top, followed by two, three, and, 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 and so forth. So just to kind of give you an idea of what it means to rank number one for a search in, uh, certain uh, keyword or query. So the number one spot, so on the example on the left, that artistconservation.org, gets about 34.2% of the traffic. So, you know, if there's one, uh, you know, let's say there's uh, 5,000 uh, searches per month, 34% of those would go to that number one position. Number two would get 17%, then 11, then eight. And then you can see how, you know, the, the, the farther down you are from number one, the faster uh, uh, you basically start decreasing in, in the amount of traffic that you're gonna get. So therefore, why is it so important to rank number one? It's basically the, just the huge discrepancy of traffic difference that's happening here uh, between 34% and 17%, that's almost double. Um, so just to give you an idea of why, when somebody says, why, you know, why is it important to rank? It's because you're gonna get qualified traffic to your website. 
Um, now, the SERP today, what does it look like? Here's an example of the Dallas Cowboys. You can see that it's not just links anymore. It's a knowledge panel on the right. Uh, you have a top stories carousel. You have a Twitter carousel. You have the social links. You have a video carousel. So it's much more dynamic. Uh, there's a lot more visuals going on. Um, so that's kind of where we are today, where you know you, your eyes have so much to look at that in order to stand out, you need to do certain things to your website. So here are a couple of examples of search result types. Um, and we call these rich results uh, be, as opposed to just regular results where you have the title and the meta description underneath. These are rich in that they have uh, images or certain types of star ratings. Um, so you have a featured video. Um, for example, a featured video appears at the very top of a search. So it's a very kind of like, this is the ultimate answer, um, uh, which is very powerful for a brand. Um, you have a featured how-to. So anytime you have a how-to uh, question, a lot of the times it's accompanied by a little description of, of, of what it is with some images. Uh, you can also have uh, critic reviews. You can have product with ratings. You have map packs for local searches. You have related image searches. You have video with, videos with thumbnails, podcasts, and, and so on. So there's just so many new things that Google is putting out every day um, that you know you want to make sure that you're taking advantage so that you're so that when users are, are looking for you there you stand out more uh, in the SERP. So uh, quickly ranking factors you know this is kind of debated upon in our industry a lot of the time people are like are saying that there are you know over 20 ranking factors 100 ranking factors but I kind of just uh, distilled it into these one, two, three, four, five, seven. Um, just because honestly, this is really what you should worry about. Number one, authority, who you are. So even though, you know, it's, we're talking about your offline presence, your physical presence in the real world, that matters um, because it'll lead to all these other things. But you wanna make sure you, you have an authority of, of, you are an authority of, 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 who, of what kind of vertical you're trying to, to be in, in this case, uh, the art vertical um backlinks like we talked about so you want to be able to create a web so that when google looks at the back end of your website they're saying okay uh for example cedars union okay they're connected to all of these artists websites plus all of these museums so they you know in google's eyes you become relevant in the art community um so backlinks are very important uh, if you have a, a property website property out there, start to reach out to, to other websites that you want to be associated with um, and, and ask for, you know, a link on the website and then you put a link on their site. It makes a connection. It's like the ultimate uh, digital handshake, if you will. Um, content buckets, we'll go a little bit into this in the content section, but uh, you want to be able to nest your content into sections. So if you want to be an authority on sculptures specifically, you want to make sure that, you know, the images about sculptures are nested here, the content about it, the stories, um, the dissertations, whatever it is, everything that has to do with sculptures, it's, it's its own kind of nested area on the website because Google wants to see that you, you don't only have one page that talks about sculptures, you have a whole kind of section about it. Uh, domain health. So, Basically, when um, a search engine robot goes to a website, uh, it basically starts on your homepage and then it starts to go into links and goes to different places. Um, so if, if you have a, um, a page that's an error page, we call that a 404 error page where you click a link and it's like, oh, this page doesn't exist anymore. Um, you know, that could be like a stop for an, a search engine by where it just stops crawling your website because it, it reaches that kind of closed door instead of another open door. Um, so domain health, uh, we'll go into uh, it a little bit more in the technical section, like what kind of tools you can use, but it basically gives you a grade of how healthy your website is. Uh, how many broken links does it have? Uh, low HTML to text ratio, just different things that you can tweak uh, to make sure that you have the highest visibility to uh, search engine uh, robots. Um, next up security. Um, so whenever you look at a website, if it has an HTTPS, uh, URL, that means it's, um, secure normally, but you also want, uh, you always want to make sure that you have an, uh, what's called an SSL certificate. Uh, it's, it's very cheap nowadays. It costs like five bucks, but you want to make sure you, your domain, your website has one. 
Um, especially if you conduct any type of e-commerce on your website, um, uh, hackers can uh, uh, kind of, that's kind of how they get, they can get in if you don't have an SSL certificate. So just to kind of keep your brand image safe, uh, just get an SSL certificate, five bucks, super cheap. Um, you usually have to renew it every year, but you can buy it for like a five year period if not. And lastly, mobile friendliness and page load speed, uh, which have to do with the overall user experience. I'll kind of go into these a, a little bit more here in the next two slides. So as far as mobile friendly, uh, Google um, uh, basically launched this thing called mobile first indexing. What it means is that now, uh, starting last year, Google um, basically crawls your website using Googlebot smartphone, where before it crawled as Googlebot desktop. Um, so what that means is that now your mobile version of your website is how Google will judge of how it ranks. Um, so you want to make sure you're mobile optimized. Um, this happened July 1st, uh, 2019 uh, for all old websites. But if you launch one today, you will automatically be mobile first indexed. Um, so basically all this to say, think mobile when designing a site, um, you know, if, if you're paying somebody to build your site and they're showing you desktop mockups and you have to ask for mobile, I would fire them immediately. Like, yeah, just like make sure they're showing you both desktop and mobile because how Google views your uh, website or mobile is how it will rank. So just keep that in mind when you're designing websites. And as far as page load speed, um, this is fairly new about two months ago. Google came out and said, okay, it's not just about how quickly it loads. We're going to break it down into three different uh, sections. This is super technical. Uh, so, you know, I'll, I'll send like the, the safe copy. You guys can look through it, but really quickly, large contentful paint. How quickly does something like does the entire page load? So this is like the old measure of how Google used to rank you. Uh, first input delayed is like, how quickly can you see something appear? You know, if you see a white screen for three seconds, uh, that's definitely bad. You want to be able to see something so that you feel that it's starting to load. Um, and then cumulative layout shift. So that's when like you, a, a button loads and you're about to go click it and then it quickly moves like Google's trying to, you know, that's a poor user experience. So you want to make sure that um, you're looking at all these uh, new metrics. All right. And then kind of a look at, um, like this is kind of a recent trend uh, that we didn't realize it was happening, but basically it's called a zero click search. What that means is that if a searcher uh, is looking at this, is, is for information, uh, Google serves the information and then a user leaves. They never have to visit a website um, and then they exit Google, right? So for the purpose of today, we'll be, we'll be talking about like a user that is either satisfied by Google or a publisher and then exits Google without ever visiting a website. And I'll give you an example um, here in the next slide. But so this graph, what it's showing is organic click through rate, that blue line in the middle, you can see that it's been decreasing for the past two years, um, which means that, you know, when somebody goes uh, organically to Google searches for something, most of the time they're not clicking to websites anymore. Um, and then you can see that the zero click search is actually increasing, um, which makes sense. So uh, for example, before, uh, you know, before this all happened uh, four or five years ago, you searched weather uh, from the Toronto area, you would get a list of five websites where you could go visit and get your information. Uh, now Google just displays the information right there. Um, so, it's they're turning into an answer engine as opposed to a search engine um, because they want to keep you there. They want to keep you on their platform. They don't really want you to go to another website. Um, so by creating these kind of rich results, they're kind of keeping people there um, um, on the Google platform. But so just, just to keep that in mind that the, the emergence of all of like the zero click search basically just means that Google wants to keep everybody on their platform. So we kind of have to, uh, tweak certain things to make sure that uh, we're not giving all the information right away so a user would end up clicking uh, through to the website. And uh, just another thing, search intent. Um, hopefully after this, you can kind of look at search, uh, the search engine results page, the SERP, a little differently. 
But so search intent basically means like, what's the meaning behind the search and the why of the search? And uh, they can be broken down into three different types. So navigational, for example, if you search for art shows near me or art galleries near me, whatever it is, and you see a map pack with three businesses um, or location aggregators like Yelp ranking as well, um, then that is a navigational type of search, right? Uh, there's also transactional, which shows you like shopping ads, product reviews. An example is like art painting for home. You know, you're ready to purchase. Um, and then informational. Now this, you know, these are the majority of all questions uh, asked on Google. So you'll get like an answer box at the top, a how to carousel, a video snippet, uh, basically giving you the answer at the very top. Um, for example, like how do you collect art? Um, so if we look back at the rich results, which we talked about earlier, you can start to see like, for example, the, the video, that's informational. The how to, informational. The critic review informational, the product with the rating and the stars, that's transactional. And that basically, when you see the, the ratings and the stars, you're saying, okay, um, you know, I'm ready to convert. And the fact that that has good ratings, okay, that it makes it more likely for you to click on that. Um, and then the map pack, that's navigational. So all this to say is if you ever wonder, you know, I want to rank for this, look at what the results are. You know, if you want to rank for best painter in Dallas and you see that the results some of them are videos, some of them are images, some of them are whatever. You want to make sure that you kind of reverse engineer the content to match what Google is showing you. Because what Google is showing you, there's a reason why it's, that information is displayed that way. They've already gone through the process of, of saying what's the best type of content and how do people like, how do people like to uh, kind of uh, decipher that content? That's not the word I'm looking to for. Um, but does that make sense? And uh, it might not, but it's, it's kind of a way to start looking at a Google differently. Just based on the results that you see, you can start to see what information, what type of content you need to create uh, in order to start ranking uh, on that page one. All right. So if that wasn't technical enough, let's go a little bit into so technical, uh, basically we use tools uh, at work. One's called SEM Rush, the other one's called Screaming Frog. Uh, they're basically a, a robot emulator. They just, they mimic a robot and then they go into your website and they analyze what's the health of it. Uh, what are the main errors, warnings, notices, that kind of thing. Errors are things like broken links, broken pages. Warnings are kind of like a little more nitty gritty. Like there's more code on the back end than content on the actual page. And that's bad. There should really be about 20% content compared to the, the ratio of uh, HTML. That's way too technical. Wow. Um, sorry. And then uh, notices again, a little, you know, I would worry more about errors and warnings, um, but that's something that, um, that can, they can take a look at. Another thing is uh, schema uh, again, super technical, but, Schema is a coding language that the search engines created, like uh, uh, Google, Yahoo, Yandex, Bing got together and they said, okay, we need to create a coding language for search engines only. So basically it's a type of JavaScript code and you can see uh, on the left side that's highlighted, that's, that's a schema type for a medical organization. This is uh, one of our uh, clients. So basically you put the schema on the back end and it creates this knowledge panel that's branded on the right uh, with the logo, you know, who the CEO is, uh, that kind of thing. Um, so uh, schema is something that you can use. You can go to schema.org. It basically, there's a schema for everything, anything you could ever think of, medical condition, uh, books, concerts, events. So using schema on your site uh, creates the rich results that you see in the, in the, the SERP. Uh, so definitely recommend it to use uh, schema on your site. And then finally, uh, sitemap and robot. So if you're just curious person, like I am, you can go to any type of, uh, URL like cedarsunion.org and then just, uh, put backslash sitemap.xml. This one redirects to this one, but, uh, basically this is where you can see what pages are being submitted to Google. Um, so you just want to make this as efficient as possible. A lot of the times these plugins like Yoast, they have a lot of fluff. So you just want to make sure you have the, the actual pages you want Google to see. 
Um, and then on the right side is a robots file. Again, you can go to any URL and type and type slash robots.txt. And basically when a Google bot or any type of search engine bot reaches your website, this is the, pla the first place they visit. So basically uh, it tells them where to go and where not to go. Um, so if, you, if it, this is really an issue with like huge websites where you have those weird URLs with like the slash asterisk question mark, whatever, that it can cause like the Google bot to just slow down your website and it doesn't really get a good picture of it. So you can build little directives of like, uh, ignore the question mark, ignore the asterisk, whatever it is, so that Google reaches the right pages and makes it, uh, it's called uh, crawl efficiency. It just makes the crawl as efficient as possible. Okay, technical, done. <laughs> um, so content, so once you have kind of like the, the uh, you know, your site technically where it needs to be, or if you're starting, especially if you're creating a new website, you wanna take a look at the site architecture. So it's, I would really recommend to like, to draw it out, you know, what does this look like? This is your home page. Uh, this is where the information is going to be about um, your paintings or sculptures or whatever it is. You want to be able to to think about that beforehand uh, so that once you're building it, everything just falls into into place. So, for example, this top, uh, the top right image is uh, a crawl I did of Cedars Union. So you can see that um, the very middle top a line that's kind of the home page and then you can see how every all the information is nestled uh the bottom one is the dma honestly i couldn't get through the entire crawl because their robots file is set to uh for me not to be able to do my job basically um so whoever set that up good job on them uh but but yeah uh, the the dma has like so many different subdomains so you can see to google it's like this whole other thing so just Think about the architecture uh, beforehand because um, that kind of plays a role to where the bot goes. And then content clusters, you know, kind of hand in hand. Um, so these are uh, basically content pieces that live on your website and uh, they're kind of all linked to a, an overarching subject. So basically Google, when Google looks at, uh, you know, are you an authority on being a painter in Dallas? They want to be able to see not only one page like we talked about, they want to be able to see that there is a multitude of pages on your site that talk about your authoritativeness on that subject. All right, the other thing, um, as far as keyword opportunities, again, these are some of the other tools, SEMrush, again, Bright Edge and Keyword Tool IO. These tools kind of give you the search volume of, um, of keywords. Uh, again, that's at a national level. So if you look at it enough, it starts to present opportunities of, hey, there's nobody ranking for these keywords right now, or um, this is a less competitive landscape. So let's go ahead and create content for that area. But, um, uh, here's, a, so if, if I it look, just me looking at this page on the right, where it says group show for wildlife art, I know that's a random, uh, search, uh, probably not a very high search volume, but the point is, is that the fact that there are no rich results on this page to me immediately says opportunity, you know, like if you are searching and you see pages that look like this you have a, like there's a huge opportunity for you to be able to rank at least in the top five positions uh if you know if you do things um if you look at you know kind of like setting it up uh not only technically but having the content to back it up um the the pages that are filled with rich results like the dallas cowboys like yeah don't even try to to get into that space like look for little kind of nuances of little searches try doing searches on your own and if you see a page that looks like this, that's definitely an opportunity to create content for that keyword. All righty, so local and e-commerce. So Google My Business and Google Merchant Center. So here's an example. Obviously the Cedars Union has a Google My Business listing, uh, but uh, it's missing information. For example, a phone number. So sorry to call you guys out, but uh, the, the point is that you want to make sure that you fill out every single type of information, whether it's what category you're in, uh, your phone number. Uh, if you're doing virtual tours, you wanna to have a link to that. Uh, just because when people search locally, they wanna be able to have this information. 
Another big kind of misconception is that Google is in charge of uh, the efficacy of the information here. Like a lot of people say, oh, well, it says you're open, so you know you must be open. No, it's, it's always up to the business owner. Um, and something else, um, for, as far as local SEO, yeah, Google is king, right? So you wanna be, have a Google My Business, but you also wanna look at other uh, search engines. You, want, uh, you might wanna look at Bing, uh, Bing Places, it's called. Um, so you wanna have a property there. Uh, just in case anybody happens to be looking in different search engines, you wanna be sure, uh, you wanna make sure that you're visible. Um, so it's free to sign up. Um, another thing that they're doing is they're offering Google posts, which uh, appear just below this Google My Business listing. And you can have things like, uh, you know, you can have a visual with a link to an event uh, and you can send people to different parts of your website. The cool thing about it is that it just gives you more visibility right there in the SERP um, as opposed to, you know, having other competitors possibly steal that spot. So uh, definitely looking to Google My Business. They used to have a thing where you used to send a postcard. Uh, they used to send a postcard to the business. You had to sign it or something and send it back. Nowadays, they, uh, they, they just uh, basically call you and they say, okay, I'm gonna send you a code. Um, whenever you get the code, you know, put a, input it here on the site and you're good to go. So you, know, you could potentially do that with any business nowadays. Um, Actually, the place I just moved into, a, some photographers lived here. So when you Google my address, there's there's still a, a Google My Business listing for a photography business, uh, which is pretty funny. You're not supposed to be able to do it out of residential, but I mean, Google can't keep up with um, all these new uh, kind of uh, businesses. So definitely take advantage of that. Um, and it's, it's, it's definitely needed for any type of local searches. If somebody, a collector or somebody searching for cool, you know, I always, cool new artists, you know, whatever artists around Dallas, whatever it is, um, you want to make sure you have a going business because you want to be present for those searches. Um, and finally, Google Merchant Center. This is if you're uh, selling any type of, uh, if you have an e-commerce aspect to your website, um, because you know, if you do like a search for these Nike Tangent Women's, um, you have like this knowledge panel on the right um, where you're now able to shop directly on the SERP without ever going to any of these websites, uh, which is again, what Google's trying to do. They're trying to more or less become like Amazon where they're, they can fulfill any search that you want, um, whether it's informational, navigational, transactional, right there in the SERP. So, if you do sell uh, any type of merchandise, definitely get a Google Merchant Center account. Uh, again, it's free. Um, and you can also run um, ads if you wanted to. Um, uh, same with Google My Business. But yeah, it's just uh, you know things to take advantage of that are free, um, that just give you, uh, give you more visibility. And then just a quick look at the future. Um, so taking a look at voice search, for example, I know the stat is a little old, but I mean, you can just imagine now, but the number of smart speakers in US house households has increased by 78% year over year from 6.7 million to 118.5 million in a year, that was in 2018. All this to say, you know, if there's some sort of audio aspect to uh, a performance or uh, art, you definitely want to, to, to make sure that you're incorporating correctly. So um, again, when we talk ab about, if you look at the screenshot, uh, the little rich result at the top, what is voice search? And it has a little featured snippet or answer box, as we sometimes call it. 41% uh, of the time, more or less, Google is going to pull that as the voice answer. So as opposed to a, a normal search engine, when you search, there's more or less 10 results, right? But when it comes to voice, there can only be one. Uh, which is another reason why Google was moving into kind of serving these answer boxes at the very top uh, is for voice. So an example, at least you want to make sure that if somebody says call Stubbs Gallier, call Cedars Union, that you appear with this hyperlink so that if you're on mobile, you can just click that button and you're calling, you know, as opposed to having to go dig through a website and you can do this through schema. So you can put 
um, you know, your corporation or your organization, your artist name, and then mark it with a telephone. Um, and yeah, if you have any questions about schema, I love schema. I can talk about schema all day. So feel free to reach out. Um, I can write it for you. It's not a problem. Um, and, but you can kind of get this type of results, this rich results. Um, and then obviously if somebody is on a smart speaker and does the same thing, then you would automatically rank as the number one answer. And then visual search. So Google's visual search engine is called Google lens. Um, and, uh, you know, it's, it's kind of directly built into a lot of these Android phones, the new ones that are coming out already as a default. Uh, and then, uh, they, you can also have the Google app where you can use the visual search engine. I use it a lot. Uh, when I'm out in nature, just to say, to figure out what tree something is or an insect, uh, it does a pretty good job of being able to pick up what the image is. So all this to say, with all your work, make sure you're filling out image alt tags with the name of what the piece is and your name. Uh, there's no limit on image alt tags, so fill them out. Every image, um, if you go back into the CMS, whether it's WordPress, Squarespace, every image should have a little field for image alt tags. Make sure you're taking advantage of that because that and exit data and photos is where Google is, is, is uh, able to pull this data from. So if you have any type of image, look at the exit data and you can manipulate the latitude longitude uh, information to kind of fit the location if you want to rank for things locally too. Um, so uh, any questions? How was it? How did I do on time? Uh, perfectly. And uh, can you hear me? Yes. Yeah. That was a blast. Good job, Edgar. Um, <laughs> a whole lot of information. I feel like I have a ton of questions myself. Um, okay. Let's start with other people, though. Uh, Jessica asks, are the backlinks create uh, created by the things we write on our website? Or is this a hashtag? Basically, how, how do you create backlinks? But I think okay. we're also talking about, uh, well, I'll let you answer the question. Okay, sure. Yeah, so let's say, for example, uh, my, my personal website, Edgar Cardose and then Cedars Union, right? So let's say I, I'm a part of Cedars Union. Cedars Union would create a page, ideally, about me, the artist, which would have a link at the bottom of whatever the paragraph is, it would say, for more information, visit Edgar Cardoso hyperlinked. So as soon as that's hyperlinked, that makes a connection to um, my website, for example. And then on my website, I would do the same. I would say, hey guys, I'm working at uh, Cedars Union, blah, blah. For more information, click here, boom. At that moment, you're connected. That's, that's a backlink, that's a, uh, yeah. Does that, that answer the question? Be, sorry, I was just gonna say, cause Jessica is a Cedars Union artist. Like the, if we, we do link all of our artists, which helps our SEO in theirs. Um, but if, if an artist were to link us back, like in the past, we've asked them to, if they have like a CV page that sit, says that they're working at the Cedars Union, mm -hmm. you, it doesn't have to be like a loud hyperlink, right? Like sometimes it can even like sneakily be in there. I mean, it needs to be a hyperlink in order for it to be like a real backlink. Right. It can't just be mentioned. I mean, if it's mentioned, yeah, it's picked up by search engines, but the backlink is like what Google's looking at is like what connections are made, you know? Like right. if one person is getting is uh, giving a hyperlink, but the other one is not giving it back, to Google is like, oh, that person doesn't really trust this other person or whatever that entity is. So Google wants to see one link going this way and then another link going that way. Yeah, I mean, like it doesn't have to be like blue and underlined. Um, if you're it does, about, yeah. Like, it has to be. I mean, uh, okay, you're just saying hyperlink, but not blue and orange underline. Yeah, like if you're yeah. worried about the style of look, like a, I don't know, you know, we're talking about. That's, yeah, I mean, that's allowed, but uh, then you get into um, ADA compliance, uh, like uh, disability, like people with, uh, you know, color blindness, you know, you, you can't be sneaky like that because of that. Interesting. Good to know. Yeah. Okay, um, next question. So with Google Merchant, you purchase right there. Does it make it harder to get users to go and explore your own website? People looking for quick answers. Yes, it does. Um, this, this is more if you have a product that you really just want to get out and sell and you're not really worried about traffic. 
but yeah, it would, it would basically take away from traffic to your website. Yes, definitely. So it's more of just like a business e-commerce play. Uh, yeah. Yeah. Like for these webinars, for instance, like it, it would help our website traffic if, if on Facebook we linked everyone to the event page and then they went to the, the Zoom registration, but we instead linked it directly to Zoom, which we could embed, but I don't know how. Um, do I need an e-commerce on my site if I'm using Google Merchant for free? Hmm, that's a good question. Um, I don't... Uh... You might not actually, because all you all you would do is you basically create an Excel file with like all the products that you have, including they have to have like ASIN numbers or not ASIN, that's Amazon, um, UPC or all those, whatever the barcode number is. So just like as far as they need to be an official product. But once you do that, you can just upload the Excel file and it'll go into the Google Merchant feed. So I, I've never done it. I've never seen it done that way. But yeah, I think you could do it that way if you wanted to. Okay. Um, I have some questions too, Edgar. Uh, first of all, I want to ask, uh, do you do this freelance? If, if these people listening are like, wow, this is awesome, but I, it's too much for me to buy it off. Do you have yourself or someone you could recommend to? Yeah, help? no, I'm available to, to freelance. Okay, um, great. Well, I'll share out your contact with everyone after the, um, the webinar. Uh, as far as schema goes, when you go to schema.org and uh, it gives you, you know, different schema for different keywords, I suppose. Yeah. If someone has um, like a Squarespace, for instance, I'm just going to assume some of these artists do, where mm -hmm. do they enter that schema? So usually you want to put it in the head or the body of the website. Um, Google, yeah, I've seen it done the footer and it also works, but Google says the header or the footer. Um, it can be anywhere in there. And Square, I know Squarespace, I've done it before. There's there's an area where you can add additional JavaScript or CSS. Yeah. Uh, and so since this, since schema is a type of JavaScript, you, you can just put the script um, in that area in Squarespace. And then WordPress, I think either the Yoast plugin has an area where you could do it. Um, or yeah, I, I'm not familiar. With, I'm not, I can't remember where exactly on WordPress it's done, but I know there is a way to do it. Um, sometimes there's plugins in WordPress where you can in, inject something into the header. Um, so I would try that. The other one that's really more complicated is putting it through Google tag manager. But honestly, I would, I go against that. A lot of people say that's fine, but I think being like hard coding it into your website is the way to go. Um. Okay. Um, so if the, does the user see, the user doesn't see that schema, it just shows up as the regular text? Yep. Okay, interesting. Yeah, I mean, I can show you, hold on. Let me see if I can. Okay, are you seeing, oh, there we go. Yeah, so for example, like you see how, right? This is one of our clients and, wow. So yeah, basically this is their website. Um, you can't really see the schema, but if you go into, and you can do this with any website to see if they do have schema and you can, this is the best way to do it. Look at a website, look at it if they have schema, if they do copy it. Um, so for example, this one, the script starts here and it's for the medical organization. Uh, it ends there. Oop. And that's it. It's only read by the robots and not by the user. <laughs> Interesting. And then that looks like what on the, on the user side, just this. Yeah. Well, it's going to show up on Google. Hold on. <coughs> Excuse me. It's uh, this panel right here. Uh, we don't have a phone number, by the way. 
Ah, okay. <laughs> but I didn't know that that was uh, hurting against us. Um, yeah, the other thing is that um, it says, usually when I see this, the suggestion that it owns this business, it means that nobody's claimed it. Um, so was, just make sure you go in there and see if there's any messages to see if you need to approve anything. Um, another thing, so when we have Instagram marketing lectures, uh, we mm -hmm. talk about authenticating your account. Um, how connected is that to SEO? Say that one more time. And, okay, so when for Instagram accounts, yeah, um, you have you, your uh, the algorithms work better if you're seen as an authority. And in order to like reach better authority status, you have to authenticate your site on the back end of Instagram and okay. they'll basically certify you or not. Yeah. Um, and I was curious to know, like we've thus far, thus oh, far wow, gotten great. rejected for instance, but I think it's cause there's not a lot of like articles about us. Maybe, I don't know. I, I'm, um, I mean, how do they do that? Yeah, I'm not sure how the Instagram algorithms work, but I, anytime you authenticate a site, yes, you're going to have a better connection from your website property to whatever that, if it's a social property or whatever it is, like the Google search console, I'll show, I'll show you guys what, like what it looks like, but basically that's the way to authenticate your website with Google. Yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, um, so yeah, this is another free service. Um, I don't know, like, no, let's do, yeah, chop down. So basically like it'll show you the search results. We'll show you like how many clicks did you get? What the, the keyword was, what pages it hit, the countries it came from the devices. Um, and then here's the new core web vitals that I was talking about as far as page load speed. Um, you know, you can go into whether it's mobile or desktop, it'll show you what the core pages are, what the, so this is large contentful paint, that kind of thing. So, uh, mobile usability, you can also see if any pages are showing any mobile errors. Uh, and then if Google really has a problem with your website or if they want to just de-index you that you will get a message here, like where it says manual actions or security issues before they do it. So just looking at search console all the time is a good way to just kind of stay ahead of, of any potential issues. And then links, this is like where um, you can look at your backlinks. Awesome. Um, does anyone else listening have any questions? I don't see anything. Um, okay, I guess I just wanna add, um, as Edgar gave us all that great information that you can take advantage of um, is, is the part where uh, he's talking about your offline presence. So um, what you do outside of with your website, for instance, um, like I know for me, um, when you search my name, Adrian Lichleiter, one of the top things that comes up is a workshop I did with oil and cotton it's got to be a couple years ago. Um, and that helps. Oh, goody. Okay. <laughs> yeah, you can see mine. Um, come on, Edgar. There you go. There's your test. So <laughs> the, it is good. It's a good practice to Google yourself and see what comes up. See oil and cotton. It's like one of the, it comes right after my website. Right. Um, and what other things you're involved with, you know, ask them to link you or uh, mention your name, you know, like I, I after this uh, webinar is done, I wonder if you search Edgar Cardoze, if the Cedars Union. Oh yeah, don't, yeah. don't, don't Google my name. I purposely do really <laughs> bad SEO for my name. <laughs> <laughs> uh, um, but yeah, just looking at this, I would bet that it's backlinks. The reason why this is outranking 100 West Corsicana Instagram, because it's social. And then this one is your website is branded. So yeah, like if you go on my name, you like my website, I don't even know if I still. So then it's <laughs> images, yeah. Yeah, you're in there. 
<laughs> I know. Uh, but then, for example, you don't have a knowledge panel, uh, which is a little difficult to get because you need a Wikipedia article. Um, but you could potentially write a Wikipedia article by yourself, or you could write it about each other. You could have a friend and you're like, hey, I'll write yours, you write mine. And then you create like person schema on your website and tie it to Wikipedia. And then you'll create a knowledge panel for yourself. Like, mm -hmm. like our friend, Andrew Combs, um, like this guy, you know, how you have like your website. Um, it, all this is possible if you have a Wikipedia article, as soon as you have a Wikipedia article, create schema on your website, tie it together. Um, and I can do that. Um, and then you can create this whole, kind of branded experience for yourself. That's, that's a good tip too. Okay, so you've, you, in five minutes, is there any, if, if, if an artist that is like low tech doesn't really like messing with their website, so maybe isn't gonna take advantage of all these things you've given us, what would yeah. you think is like the top thing that they should look into to increase their SEO efficiency? Um, I, yeah, I would definitely start by Googling yourself, um, see where you stand, see what kind of results are, are there. If you're not seeing any images and you're, a, uh, an image heavy artist, you know, if you make a lot of paintings, then, okay. Then look at the images on your website and make sure they're all tagged. Um, and then, uh, definitely use Google search console, Google analytics, like use the free tools that Google gives you. Uh, and there's a lot of documentation out there. Um, I'll, I'll, Adrian, I can send you like a list of URLs of, of things like blogs you can read about SEO just to kind of keep up to date. Cause you know, it's funny when we present an SEO at the beginning, we usually say, uh, this information is good for six hours and then basically self-destruct, you know what I mean? Cause it, Google is changing so fast that by tomorrow, all this information could change. Um, so you definitely want to keep up to date with what's happening organically. Um, and then use, yeah take advantage of the free tools and, and reach out if you have any questions. Well, speaking of, we have two more just before, um, as you're talking, um, one, I have a free WordPress site. Do they update their templates with the latest Google standards? If not, can these improvements be added to a free WordPress template? I uh, should be able to, there's a lot of plugins, uh, that you can download. I would look at the ratings and reviews just to make sure it's a plugin that works efficiently. Uh, but yeah, just look at plugins. If you have a free WordPress site, just take advantage of plugins, uh, that support Yoast SEO is definitely one that is very standard, helps you with like page title, meta description, focus keyword, that kind of thing. And that's a free service as well. Okay. And then Jessica Baldivieso, um, she's one of our cohort two studio artists. Um, she's asking about what she can, if, if she should be changing her name site to like something slash cedarunion.org. Um, and Jessica, I was going to say, and we can also, um, <laughs> we can also talk later but if you just like it I, I think the cv is a great place to list it because you're probably already listing that you're on at cedars union and so you can link cedars union on your cv um but yeah i would keep the web you know if you have a personal website i wouldn't change the name yeah. like we have clients sometimes that say oh we want to rebrand and change the domain and it and it's a pain in the neck because you know, you have all this equity built into the existing domain. So like to switch it, you're basically going to start from zero unless you like do 301 redirects. It's, it's very technical. So I, I would keep the domain you have. Um, and then I'm seeing who's in the bed. Uh, this, so my background is uh, at the very end of 2001 Space Odyssey. Um, so I don't want to ruin it if you haven't seen it. So I won't say who's there. <laughs> I think that's a great place to end. Great. <laughs> All right. Okay, well, I'll email you guys uh, those links and Edgar's contact. Thank you so much. That was really interesting. Um, sure. And uh, it was great of you to share. Absolutely. Yeah. All right. Have a good evening. <laughs> See y'all. Bye. Bye.